Good morning, everybody. So I want to talk a little bit today about my research using the SIMS measure, this subjective importance of smoking measure. It's a little bit background about cigarette smoking, although I believe you're pretty familiar with much of this information. So cigarette smoking remains the leading preventable cause of death and disease in the United States. Smoking prevalence is 15% among U.S. adults and as it's is as high as 26% among adults living below the poverty line. Now, people do want to quit smoking. In fact, each year, some two-thirds of U.S. smokers make a quit attempt. Unfortunately, less than 5% remain abstinent three months post-quit. Factors associated with unsuccessful quitting include nicotine dependence, poor mental health, low social support for quitting, stress, and lower self-efficacy beliefs. Now, I've had the misfortune of knowing many, too many smokers in my life, and I've never been a smoker myself, but I've known so many, and my observations of smokers non-scientific observations of smokers indicate that smokers identify with cigarettes and cigarette smoking. So essentially smoking cigarettes and cigarette smoking become a part of who the individual believes the self to be as a person. To me this suggested a need to better understand the role of smoking related beliefs. And my, my training, my original training was in, in research on self-concept. So questions I would ask are what role do cigarettes and cigarette smoking play in a smoker's beliefs about the self? And how does that affect smoking cessation? Because that's our ultimate aim. My aims were to develop a measure to assess the subjective importance of cigarettes and cigarette smoking to smokers and to assess its role in the smoking cessation process. The theory guiding my research is psychoadaptation. In this theory, beliefs motivate, or beliefs and conceptions are, are the same. So you could have beliefs about yourself, or conceptions about yourself, and conceptions about the world around you, your worldview. Both of those motivate behavior. To change behavior, one must assess one's own conceptions for validity identify conceptions at odds with the date of experience. So we all, we all have beliefs, we all have theories about ourselves, theories about the world around us, and those theories can be accurate or inaccurate, and it's important for us to continually assess the validity of those theories. And when we do that, that allows us to make changes and to actually refine our theories. That's associated with a lot of distress at times because when we're wrong, it's not a very, very pleasant experience. So we have to allow ourselves to experience distress. And I use uh, Piaget's, the, the Swiss psychologist Piaget's vernacular disequ term, disequilibrium. To, to overcome disequilibrium, one must reconceptualize oneself and worldview. So this is a, a mapping of the psychoadaptation process. So one has a current set of conceptions, there's feedback from the environment, feedback that can either accept or well, either accept or negate or contradict one's beliefs. When they contradict one's beliefs, this results in this experience of disequilibrium. This would have, in, in this theoretical perspective, the disequilibrium occurs to anybody, whether they're motivated to change or not. It's only whether one decides to modify one's conceptions and behaviors that one returns to a state of equilibrium, which is a pleasant state. But now they do so at a higher level because they've actually adapt, adapted to the, the novel context. In terms of smokers, what we'd like to be able to do in, in in teaching smokers to become non-smokers is to help them adapt to 
to mainstream contexts. In the mainstream, cigarette smoking is sanctioned. So essentially, it's not allowed in the mainstream. It's, it's very contra culture within the mainstream. And this is a, a source of a lot of disequilibrium for, for smokers. So we'd like to have them modify their beliefs about smoking and modify their behaviors, which is to quit smoking so they could have a new sense of equilibrium, but now having adapted to the mainstream and mainstream cultural norms. The way this is proposed to occur is when a smoker quits, a smoker leaves the confines of a context that allows for smoking and allows for beliefs about smoking and beliefs about non-smokers. Non-smokers are not nice people, they're mean, and I'm sure they use more colorful language than that to describe non-smokers. When one leaves that context, one exposes oneself to the cultural norms of the mainstream, and those cultural norms are different because they they contradict smoking. Individuals are generally higher socioeconomic status individuals. Health is a social norm. Like uh, people exercise, for instance. So, smokers being predominantly lower socioeconomic status individuals. That's not everybody, but predominantly lower socioeconomic status predominantly lower in SES includes education as well as income find it difficult may find it difficult to fit into that context and it's this fitting in process that causes a lot of disequilibrium for the now former smoker so this leaves the former smoker with two specific options either adapt and pursue a healthy lifestyle or relapse. Now in the relapse one returns to the context and within that context the smoker has already adapted so he or she feels equilibrium again. So to remain abstinent and this is where my research questions are one must be able to tolerate this equilibrium. So my question is, does the impact of the subjective importance of smoking on smoking abstinence differ by disequilibrium? In other words, will smokers who experience high disequilibrium be more likely to remain abstinent after quitting than smokers who experience low disequilibrium? So I developed this measure. 17 items were generated based on unstructured interviews with adult smokers smoking greater than or at least 20 cigarettes a day, a pack a day of cigarettes. <coughs> Excuse me. The measure was reviewed for face validity by experts. Face validity means does it, do the items look like they measure what they measure. And the first administration with the, of the study was in the nicotine dependence in teen study with the PI being Jennifer O'Loughlin at University of Montreal. This is a a cohort that's been followed from youth through probably from middle school through I think it's from middle school going back back that far through adulthood. I was looking at young adults smoking, age 21, smoking on average 57 cigarettes a week. So they didn't smoke a lot of cigarettes. So so I wouldn't expect the Sims to do really really well in 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 this. Uh, in this context because smoking, cigarette smoking would not be very important to the smokers. The second study we administered the su survey again the same 17 items and I'll, actually I'll show you the 17 items shortly same 17 items but this was in 202 adult daily smokers who had no intention to quit smoking mean age is 31 years this was a study to understand the opinions on tobacco product advertising with Andrew Strasser being the PI. Here participants smoked on average 17 cigarettes a day and smoked on average for 13 years. So these were more the more ideal smoker for excuse me, ideal smoker for the Sims. Sims did perform much better, however, participants revealed several items were 
were not worded well for them, so they provided some confusion. So though I removed those several items, three items, and also revised the items that, that uh, participants believed were difficult to understand. And in the present study, our present study involved 447 adult smokers. So by the way, this is taking place over a 10-year period here. Uh, 447 adult smokers, mean age 47, also smoking about 17 cigarettes per day. They were taking part in a randomized control trial evaluating the efficacy of long versus short-term nicotine replacement therapy using nicotine patches. And this is a, a PI was Robert Schnoll. At the, uh, Robert Schnoll and, and Andrew Strasser are both at UPenn. So our baseline assessment included demographics, smoking and nicotine dependence, prior quit attempts, psychological traits and states, and the subjective importance of smoking measure. Now this is, a, I apologize for the small print, but I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go in more detail and show you some better uh, sized print. This is the, the basic SIMS measure with its 14 items. And some of the items are, uh, I find them intriguing because they're, I would consider that in some ways a very ridiculous question, but it would be consistent with my belief that smokers really, really love their cigarettes and cigarettes become an extremely important part of who the individual is. Like, now some of these questions would make sense that smokers use cigarettes as a crutch, right? Number one, cigarettes help me get through hard times or, or smoking helps me meet new people. Those are ones that we'd expect that smokers would endorse. The ones that were more controversial were something like item eight, when I'm holding a cigarette, I feel really competent, like I can do anything. When I can't smoke, I feel like a nobody. Uh, I would feel really empty without smoking, like I lost an important part of my life. This item number 10 is very interesting because this item is one that I revised. It was originally, I would feel really empty without smoking, but uh, there was some a discussion with some colleagues who mentioned that when smokers stop smoking, their lungs actually feel empty without the, the smoke in them. So smokers might confuse this. They're, they may not be understanding what I'm trying to get at. And here what I'm trying to get at is that they feel empty like they lost some something important. Our dependent variable was smoking abstinence, point prevalence abstinence at uh, 24 weeks. And it was CO carbon monoxide verified measure of disequilibrium. Disequilibrium was our moderator variable, so I wanted to see if the effect of SIMS on, on, on abstinence differed based on level of disequilibrium, high versus low. So this is something we call moderation, or effect. Uh, disequilibrium was an effect moderator. It was a single item, and this item so these are all these are all statements that one would respond to. It's a single item that says smoking makes me feel bad about myself. So it was a it measured on a six point scale, false to true scale, with the low the lower three options being the false options and the top three options being the true options. So I I divided my sample into high versus low disequilibrium based on on either false for being low disequilibrium and true being high disequilibrium. One of the three, one had to choose one of the three options to be high disequilibrium. We controlled for prior quit attempts lasting at least 24 hours, which was our proxy for motivation to quit smoking. Controlled for treatment assignment, so standard versus extended. So again, Dr. Schnoll was studying whether whether the extended treatments were as, this is, this is I guess we'd call a non-inferiority study to see whether the, the extended treatments worked as well as the, as the standard eight-week treatment. Sex, race, income, education, and marital status were also controlled for. In terms of measuring construct validity of the SIMS, now this is a really interesting process because the method I'm using allows us to do both the f internal factor structure and construct validity at the same time in one study instead of 
collecting data twice and wasting a lot of money. Nicotine dependence, the, the standard Fagerstrom test for nicotine dependence, anhedonia, which is inability to experience pleasure. We measured anxiety and positive and negative affect using the PANIS. The data analysis, which I just mentioned, w was a method known as exploratory structural equation modeling. So it combines exploratory factor analysis with confirmatory factor analysis. So the EFA checks the number of factors underlying a construct and the CFA allows one to measure the discriminant and converge, convergent validity of, of the measure as well as we did here the predictive validity. In terms of our descriptive statistics we found out that females reported greater disequilibrium than males those reporting greater disequilibrium also scored significantly higher on anxiety, negative affect, and lower on anhedonia. So the, these, particularly the, the first two, were consistent with using the, the, the uh, single item as a measure of disequilibrium. Just some some items of interest from the from the analysis comparing low and high disequilibrium item by item so we can see that in general the there was no difference in cigarettes being a big part of an individual's identity for between higher and lower disequilibrium participants however there were some striking differences like when I'm holding a cigarette, I feel really competent, like I can do anything. This was endorsed more so, significantly more so, at a p-value of 0 0.01 by those who had higher than lower disequilibrium. An interesting one is when I can't smoke, I feel like a nobody. The people experiencing lower disequilibrium overwhelmingly claim this is false. 81% claimed it was false. Where Whereas we saw only 62% claimed it was false among those who had higher disequilibrium. I would feel really empty without smoking, like a loss, an important part of myself, or important part of my life. Again, this is significantly higher for at a, at a high at a I think it's 0 0.001. We go back 0 .0, yeah, 0 0.0001 level for for those with higher than lower disequilibrium. Being a smoker means a lot to me, no difference there. They all thought being a smoker meant a lot to them. Holding a cigarette makes me feel like I'm in control. Again, we had significant difference there, and smoking is a big part of who I am. I mean, it was endorsed by both, but there was a, a difference here. These are all chi-squares, of course, chi-squares, comparing the two groups. And you can see that this was endorsed more so at the higher level, but it, though it's not that big a difference if you look at it between those who had higher and lower disequilibrium. Those are all univariates. Univariate means one dependent variable. We'll look at the multivariate analysis. Now, part of this exploratory structural equation modeling is exploratory factor analysis. So the EFA identifies the number of factors representing the survey items. And with the EFA, there was a suggestion of a single factor representing all 14 items. So then we added the predictor variables to the model. This allowed us to assess the convergent and discriminant validity of the SIMS, its predictive validity in terms of point prevalence abstinence at 24 weeks, and to assess between group differences. So in a sense, this is our EFA, and then we added the outcome variable and the predictor variables, as well as the moderator variable. By the way, I love making these pictures. They're so much fun. <laughs> we found that nicotine dependence was associated with an increase in the SIMS among smokers reporting both high and low disequilibrium, which is important because that supports the con construct validity of the SIMS in terms of its convergent validity. We expect people who think smoking is very important to them to 
be higher on nicotine dependence. Negative effect was associated with higher subjective importance of smoking for participants reporting high disequilibrium. It was not related to SIMS for participants reporting low disequilibrium. Again, this is something that would be expected. The between group differences difference was significant. This is using a chi-square difference test. So we could say disequilibrium moderates the relation between negative affect and the SIMS. So that would be consistent with uh, psychoadaptation theory. For participants reporting high disequilibrium, SIMS was associated with a point pre with point prevalence abstinence at 24 weeks, not significant for participants reporting low disequilibrium. It was terribly not significant. Between group differences, the between group difference was significant at 0 0.04. This suggests that disequilibrium does moderate the effect of the subjective importance of smoking on abstinence at 20 four weeks, or in other words, individuals experiencing greater disequilibrium are more likely to have remained abstinent at 24 weeks than those experiencing lower disequilibrium. In this figure, we see the, the structural, the exploratory structural equation modeling with the significant effects only. And you'll notice that, we, well, what we have here is a, those with higher disequilibrium there below the, the uh, dividing line and those with lower disequilibrium are above the dividing line. So these are all standardized path coefficients, so we can actually directly compare them. So for instance, like nicotine dependence seems to have a, a stronger effect, at least in a, in terms, these are like effect sizes, right? On, on a subject of importance, they say then does negative affect slightly larger, right? Compare in for for those with higher disequilibrium. So what are our future directions here? We want to validate the SIMS in a prospective cohort study across, smoking, across the smoking cessation process. Basically, I want to use it in studies where people are undergoing smoking cessation. We also need to better understand what contextual factors influence disequilibrium and equilibrium during the smoking cessation process and to assess therapeutic interventions to improve adaptation to the non-smoking context among smokers ceasing to quit. I didn't mean those attempting to quit. Uh, SIMS only, some of the limitations were SIMS were only, was only measured at baseline, so we couldn't measure any change over time. And in all three studies, the SIMS was added to existing studies, so I didn't use, at this point, there hasn't been a study that was designed just to test the SIMS only. Uh, a third limitation that, that uh, I think we can address is that the, the, I used factor scores here, and in, for clinical use, factor scores don't make any sense. Nobody's going to do a factor analysis when you, when you give a survey to a participant. So we haven't measured it with summated scores yet. However, I believe that you could just summate the scores and use it as an indicator of the subjective importance of smoking. The findings of the study suggest the need for further research to evaluate the subjective importance of smoking and how it may impact the smoking cessation process. And uh, I would suggest applying it uh, adding the SIMS to a battery of tests administered at baseline and then a follow-up to see if the subjective importance changes over time with, with changes in smoking behavior. So this article is now published in the Journal of Smoking Cessation and it's available. You can also email me if you have, would like a copy. Uh, in terms of our funding sources, this study was funded by a grant to Dr. Schull from NIDA, and I'd like to also thank all the individuals who took part in this process, both at the University of Montreal and the University of Pennsylvania. Thank you very much. That's a wrap.